जय जगत जय जगत जय जगत हेलो विथ मी टुडे इज जिल कार हैरिस द डिरेक्टर ऑफ आई जी आई एन पी एंड ऑल्सो समबडी बीन एसोसिएटेड विद एकता परिषद नाउ फॉर ओवर थ्री डेकेड्स टू डेकेड्स सो थैंक यू सो मच जिल फॉर कमिंग इन टू दिस मीडिया लैब्स कॉन्वर्जेशन एंड आई थॉट अ गुड स्टार्टिंग पॉइंट since you are the director of an institute that brings forth the gandhian lens and gandhian studies uh and as a young person i really wonder if gandhi is still somebody cool somebody worth uh, worth kind of admiring uh and while personally i am a big admirer but i think uh, a typical young person today enjoys like gandhi bashing and uh, and also this whole idea of non violence really which gandhi spoke so much about and i mean is it even relevant in today's times we are spending so much on our arms and ammunition and to be safe and if somebody takes me on i'm going to come back in full might so really what is this whole relevance for non violence i mean is is it even fun is it even worth it <laughs> um gandhi of course died in 1948 and many people want to continue his legacy and some young people i agree say what's the relevance yeah but um it's not about gandhi it's about the values i think gandhi promoted and mm-hmm. there are people in today's india who are incredible leaders who are acting on those gandhian values and they're making huge social change so for me that raises the question well they must still be relevant if some gandhian leaders mm, are making mm. so you spoke to rajagopal he would be one but ila bat from the self employed women's association is a gandhian and she has affected not only millions of mm, women's mm. livelihood in india but also created global mm, mm. banks and other things i think vandana shiva another name well known in the environmental field is a person who has used gandhian values mm-hmm. in making us think of the local and the indigenous seed mm-hmm. as central to development mm-hmm. and so there are many i can i could name many and that that has come just to finish this that has come from a very long tradition in india you know the gandhian freedom struggle did not end at the time of independence there were sarvodaya workers gandhian workers that built education systems and a way of thinking that has endured mm-hmm. and these mm-hmm. leaders of social change or people who are promoting gandhian values are still very much with us mm-hmm. and that's what distinguishes india from many other countries and really that's why i came to india so but then is this true that when you're approaching somebody who's a gandhian worker then uh, the kurta and making sure that there's a certain demeanor and certain values and simplicity or whatever is our picture perfect image and so when we are approaching that is is that what it is like a must to carry like in today's world as a jeans and a shirt wearing uh, young person what what values which part of what gandhi spoke about uh, is something that i can take and start living with i mean i don't think a khadi shirt defines gandhian values it's symbolic because what is a khadi shirt khadi means that the people who make that cloth use their hands they're usually poor they're often women so when you think about the actions in your life you want to think about who is giving you what in life mm-hmm. so today i'm not wearing a khadi shirt but if i were to wear a khadi sari or a, a khadi salwar kameez i have instinctively some connection with the poor and marginalized mm-hmm. but i don't have to make a pretense that mm-hmm. every day every minute i'm making that connection okay. okay i only have to be conscious of the food that i eat the clothes that i wear mm-hmm. the shelter that i have around me is in some way not disrupting and creating more marginalization Hmm. that's the conscious choice that's the intent of that is all the choices yeah. but then when faced with uh, you know in i mean a normal day to day existence there is all kinds of violence small small scuffles from small yeah. scuffles to state violence to all kinds and the very immediate instinctive response to come back at right uh and right. it's a self defense response so when we think about gandhi what are we talking about transcending this response or seeing the wisdom of 
I don't know. So what what is what is well, the, I think what there's you... there's two points that I think are important to make. One is there is a belief system on self defense and so on that you mentioned, which says that persons' reactions are generally violent. Okay, that's one argument. But I have to tell you that there are empirical psychologists hmm. that say the first response of people is nonviolence, nonviolence. Okay. And that has been proven through empirical psychology, through tests and other things. Uh, VK Kool, who was um, who was a psychologist from India, who went later to the United States actually stood up to the whole psycholo American Psychology uh, Association of scholars who said, no, violence is the base. That's why we have the Holocaust. That's why we have wars. Mm, yeah. And he stood up as a lonely uh, interlocutor and said, actually, I've done tests to prove that people's first response is nonviolence. And it's very interesting to go through the work of VK Kuhl. But I think more importantly is the second point, which is that aggression and aggressive response, one has to, in one's life, if one chooses nonviolence, because that's a choice. Conflict is everywhere, but choosing nonviolence is a choice. So if one is, you know, getting angry or aggressive because your ego is being uh, you know, uh, criticized, or you're being criticized, or mm, you're feeling mm, yeah. anger and aggression. The question is whether you can flip, whether you can flip that so that you have a nonviolent response. In other words, in Sanskrit, they'll talk about ugra, 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 oh. ugra mm. aggression, mm -hmm. and ugratar, you know, more aggression, and mm. ugratam. Aggression. And this is aggression as it goes up. Mm -hmm. What? That is, let us say that's like fire. Now, how do you respond nonviolently to fire? Self defense, right? Do you add fire to that fire? Or do you add a kind of humbleness, which is like water, which is like putting water to fire? So mm -hmm. the notion of humbleness, mm. right, uh, is something also deep in the namra, mm. in namrata. The, and namrata, namrata, humble, you know, to be humble, uh, namra, humble, namrata, more humble, nar, namratam, most humble. humble, okay? So when someone is going up in aggression, instead of bringing ugra, you bring namra into play and you try to disarm aggression through humbleness, not humility, humbleness. That is to say you disconnect from aggression and you act out in a non-cooperation style how to be humble. If a sexual overture is being made by a big man and you're a small woman, what you do is you just go humble, not weak. It's a very big difference. Mm -hmm. You become humble. Yeah. Isn't it a weak humble. response? No, it's not. Humility may be closer to a weakness, but humbleness is just you make a joke. You know, you make a joke. You act with a certain humbleness. You disconnect with aggression, and you go more humble as someone goes more aggressive, and you go most humble. And I think. This is really something that we teach women in our nonviolent conflict resolution is if you're going to choose nonviolence, you choose a way to completely be humble, in it, not fearful, hmm. not weak. The weak and the fearful is what fires up aggression. Mm -hmm. You bring in but what is so, so just to understand this nuance a little more yeah, sure. uh, and in a very practical kind of, kind yeah, of real sure. life condition uh, sure. context, you know, where we a woman faces an overture from somebody uh, or yeah, not sure. necessarily active violence, but maybe somebody's catcalling or uh, you sure. know, sexual harassment, also sure. known as eating.
Sure. Or just general bullying, I think, that people face sure. and all. Sure. Uh, the immediate response is if I don't respond as strongly or more strongly, exactly. I'll not be able to silence yeah, it. Exactly. And if I if I uh, hide and cover, then that will keep increasing and I'll have admitted exactly. my Exactly. So but is this is a social conditioning, you see. What I would like to say is it's not nature, it's nurture. It's a social conditioning. And what a mother does in a family, what a good culture does, mm. as we see many cultures in India, is it helps people to be humble. Nonviolence is something that is deeply embedded in the Indian, uh, in the Indian psyche, which goes back a long way, which is why Jainism is X 15,000 years old and Buddhism is mm. 500 years old, you know. These are responses that came from culture to deal with aggression. Mm. And mm. it's deep. And most mothers, if, they're, if their two children are fighting, they bring nonviolence to it. Mm. They bring mm. a bit way of lowering the temperature, not mm. raising the temperature. This is deeply in our culture and society. So it's a more mature response in that way. And, and, and if, and it's, it's why children are so innocent, you know, they will pick nonviolence. If you guide them to nonviolence, youth will pick nonviolence as opposed to violence if you direct them in that direction. So if this is something that comes from culture. And I would say, Generally, what people do uh, is they will, so there'll be an aggressive response, some, and you'll be humble, but the aggression will go up, and you'll find it so hard to go down to one more level of degree of humbleness that you jump up to aggression. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is what requires training. Okay. This is where you need to be trained. In other words, like nonviolent communication, which uh, is very popular in the United States now and has come to many countries of the world. They talk about how uh, you handle things through communication, you know, non-reactive, how you handle anger. I think it's interesting. Anger response is about a 90-second process through the body. If you can hold anger mm -hmm. and not respond for 90 seconds, you feel lighter. And what is very interesting is that an aggressive response, if you have something you're really fighting for, you believe in, you know, and you get an angry response, if you interface with an angry response, generally what happens is you forget the issue that you were trying to uphold. You get caught up in the anger. So in fact, you lose, especially if you're a woman. You're trying to pause it then I'm your equal partner. Aggression comes from often the male side, uh, power over an anger response. And what do women do? They start to get more angry and more aggressive, thinking that's going to win, as opposed to completely deflecting and keeping the focus on the issue the itself issue. in a very cool and calm way. Mm. Because ultimately that's sustainable. And we can, we can actually jump from this level of aggression and humbleness to social movements where you have non-violent social movements and social movements that are violent. And what is very interesting is the non-violent ones tends to sustain an issue. The non-violent ones tends to get into uh, deflecting that issue into whether I can be more violent than you. Mm. And so that's why Nonviolent movements are, by every social scientist, will say they're more successful because they sustain mm. an issue, whereas the violent one deflects into power, I'm more powerful than you, yeah. in an aggressive response. So I think that's where we try to help young, uh, young people hold on to anger and use it as a creative power to direct into a constructive response. So what we are saying is if a lady is facing something, that not being okay is the core point and rather than getting caught with the anger response and then making it all about that, she sticks to the not okayness with a certain firmness but also a certain uh, humbleness you are saying that is continuing to insist on that. 
and if i hear you correctly you're saying that apply to social movements also there are social movements that make a big fuss perhaps in some ways or get caught with that anger us, us violence and, and us versus them most of the non violence ones which stay close to the core issue i think that's what you see i think there are many steps in the training of non violence so choosing non violence we've talked about a little bit in terms of controlling aggression mm -hmm. and non cooperating with an interlocutor who is aggressive so we've talked about that but the second part is communicating non violence where you learn to communicate all sorts of people uh with respect i think what's interesting is you can also disarm people before they even get aggressive through a respectful conversation by saying no mistake i see the god within you mm, yeah mm. and people like that because mm, when you mm. see the good in them mm, their mm. response is very different than if you're suspicious of them mm, or if you mm. question them or if you don't really uh like them you know but then shouldn't we be careful are you saying yes, we should trust we, the good we mix? should be careful uh in terms of respecting the other and so this language of respect mm, and mm. language of non-violent communication is quite a subject because if you think about it there are so many violent words that we say every day and this is inflaming a kind of violent response so we need to find words um you know you're all media people so you know the power of words we need to replace violent expressions with non-violent expressions you know um someone said uh, if gandhi is replacing physical force with moral force uh you know that's important but i would say force is somewhat of a violent term that grows out of a history of armies mm, and fighting mm, right? sure and so i would say it's more moving from physical force to moral suasion moral suasion, suasion okay, okay. is better than saying moral, moral force, force. Okay. because you're forcing your values if gandhi was forcing his values on his followers they would not accept but if it's a suasion you know it's a kind of a slow process of persuasion and convincing mm, mm, mm. and circles of discussion and discourse that really is a more effective word for non-violence and embodies non-violent communication much better right but uh, i think one question that comes to me uh, in this then is uh, that when we organize something or an organizations happen uh, there are policies there are rules there is uh, the, the leader or the manager exercises some amount of push uh, towards people and even corporates and employees there's, there's a force there is a push to get things done you need that right Efficient, so, so, so what are we saying yeah the efficiency you know so are we saying then that there's a whole new way of doing things which doesn't rely on the rule procedure punishment approach uh, at I, the cost of being inefficient slow or like yeah. what are we saying then well i the think there's two levels i'd first like to talk about how women in my view bring into play a kind of a different way of doing conflict resolution. Okay. I think men are more into win-win models. Yeah. Where yeah. we compromise and we resolve our conflict which really is an abs you know creating the absence of conflict but really is not building peace. I mm -hmm. think where women are very just naturally condition this way and there are many men who have this feminine quality so i wouldn't say it's exclusive to women but it is a feminine feminine quality of solving conflicts okay and that feminine quality of solving conflicts means that you listen that you don't have your ego involved mm -hmm. that you are prepared to uh spend time on the process and persist that you're not goal focused now if that kind of conflict resolution is taken seriously by corporate managers mm, which i mm, think more yeah, and more are trained, getting right, trained sure. in mindfulness yeah, and yeah, other techniques yeah, yeah, yeah. then they're going to have a better relationship internally and less pyramidal relationship of 
my mm. word you mm. obey yeah, yeah, I'm taught. Sure. so that's one level but I think in terms of rules and punitive justice which you also raised and non-violence means restorative justice it's of the belief that if in India for instance when someone is guilty we want to punish them yeah. ah they're guilty and in fact even before hearing the weight of evidence usually is on their guilt, you know, and we believe them to be guilty. And then you have to prove they're innocent, which is very unfortunate. Even for the most heinous crimes, even young people joining the I ISIS, we have to appreciate that they may have taken a decision today, but their decision tomorrow may be very different. And how to see people in a dynamic continuum psychologically mm -hmm. rather than labeling them the aggressor and they have to be punished and then they need capital punishment. I think a much better way of working with people, even people who have been involved in genocide, is to do truth and reconciliation, mm -hmm. is to let people apologize is to let people come forward and see their own failings as opposed to labeling them as the guilty mm -hmm. party. Because what does that do? If a woman is raped yeah, uh, by somebody and her parents want that person immediately killed, that may ex extinguish that particular individual, but it does not transform that relationship. Mm -hmm. What you want to do in a rape case is create a kind of restorative justice so that rape no longer is an issue in your society. That's what you're trying to do, not just kill the rapist, you know, mm -hmm. because that is the difference between punitive justice and restorative mm -hmm. justice. So I think we need to look at, you know, conflict resolution and bringing justice to a situation nonviolently. I would say women have a tendency towards it, should be, but mostly in the home and the community. And what I'm interested in is to see how to bring that out in society, those, those abilities for conflict resolution in society. So all this is nice and good, but I mean, in a world where uh, it's a rat race, where we're told to go achieve the most, do the best we can, and also this, you spoke about choosing non-violence and communicating non-violence, resolving conflicts. but. Where does in face of competition and having to reach the best I can do and also in, in that kind of a world, uh, should I not first take care of that rather than really care, like how can I care for others till I don't have my own sort of act in place and also I want to win the race, right? There's a very deep desire there. So where does the non-violence stand in, in, in this kind of a, a scenario today where we're being pushed to go achieve more, better than others? So. I think the push and pull is around money and economy, yeah. right? Uh, we compete in order to get the best global job in the best corporation yeah. to have the greatest potential for accumulating capital, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of what it's about. And um, I think what the problem is, is that if we are only thinking of getting money and material wealth at the expense of peace, then we begin to have a real disconnect. So what we're seeing in the world today is we're seeing the last, since, since the war, there has been the Second World War and the rise of you know, the European states and then laterally the rise of China and now India becoming a global power. What we see is the main uh, uh, problem has been the concentration of wealth in fewer and fewer hands. Mm. In the mm. 70s, there was more what we might call re redistributive justice. There was a redistribution that went from people's taxes to helping people who didn't have work, who didn't have jobs. By the mid-1980s, the wages were not rising. They mm. were stagnant in the West and, and prices uh, kept rising. And so slowly in the Western states, the middle class started to move down. 
Now, simultaneously in the 90s, early 90s, with the new economic reform process, there was initially new opportunities in India, new wealth creation and opportunities. you were the beneficiaries in a way of... And you were, that. and India, we were the beneficiaries yeah. of a new way, except that the problem is whenever the marketplace grows and expands to so-called give to more people, the pie gets divided more unfairly and skewed in favor of the rich. So what we have now is we have 25 families hmm. in the world that control 50% of the world's wealth. Mm, mm, right. Mm. So we have got to a level in India, we have for the first time uh, m billionaires who are controlling huge chunks of the Indian economy, uh, you know, commensurate to millions and millions of people who have uh, no wealth. So because we're creating those kinds of structures, poverty, civil unrest, I mean, all you have to do is go to rural areas and see the conflicts in the rural areas. Uh, one of the conflicts that stands out so much in my mind is visiting some displaced people, Adivasi people, from the Narmada Valley, which is close to here. And Maharashtra has been a beneficiary of that power project, the Narmada mm. Dams. Those tribals that were displaced five years later, in their new location, are now being redisplaced. okay? So what you find with the Adivasi communities is in the space of one generation, 25 years, they may be displaced as many times as five times, mm. where they start from scratch. Mm. Now, if there's no way that people can live peacefully with a basic income, a basic livelihood, if they're constantly being displaced. 60 million people have been displaced since independence, mm -hmm. mostly indigenous people in India. So these are the consequences of the wealth generation. These are not just because of bad government policies. These are as a result of certain economic structures. And so if I am a student and I want to get a job, and I'm studying law, and I want to join the mining company, and I've got to realize that that mining company may be displacing the indigenous communities and may be creating civil unrest. And it may be that my children may have a house and a car, but they may have absolutely no peace. Now, my decision is, do I want to live in a society that is completely without peace? But, uh, but I wanted to just uh, kind of question that a little more yeah. uh, because one argument in fact is that when there is abundance or wealth uh, maybe people are fulfilled and there is more peace and so the idea of trickle down economics and when the pie is expanding eventually there is an eventually always that says that uh, it'll, the benefits will flow into the larger group and also if I really empathize with the billionaire he or me or anybody else is just trying to get the best that they can right? we are all in this race to say I want to do the best I can with what I have uh, in a way that maximizes my happiness, right? I mean, that's the same thought process that we're all uh, in a way locked into. Yeah. Uh, and that may personally be unsettling, but I'm saying, so what are we saying that we unlock ourselves from this process of I maximizing? I think, um, you know, the trickle down, which you've mentioned, is a, an ideological position. It is not an actual fact. Okay. We know that trickle down does not actually work uh, because if there's a concentration of capital at the top, that means that trickle down is not working. It means mm -hmm. that wealth is being concentrated. Mm -hmm. Okay, number mm -hmm. one. Number two, of course, we can be, we can see ourselves in the middle class looking up at the models of a William Buffett, mm. you know, a Bill Gates, mm. uh, you know, a, a, um, an Ambani uh, and so on. But I think basically this is again a myth that we are being, our expectations are here, but the reality is mm. we do not move up. In mm. fact, if you look at things carefully, we move down. 
Mm. And so uh, this is where the perspective of shifting, a non-violent perspective would be not to look up at the, viol the leaders of what is a, a society based on concentration of capital which is leading to violence, but looking at common ordinary people's lives and seeing how more mm. and more people can be included in the development model. Mm. And if mm. we don't do that, if we don't have a belief in redistributive justice, mm. then we're going to live in more and more centralized authoritarian structures because neoliberalism leads to non-democratic behavior. Mm. You mm. cannot mm. have an undemocratic economy and a democratic sure. governance. Yeah. So this is what we're faced with, and I think what we're seeing in terms of this fourth uh, level of peace, uh, nonviolence, is that can we make peace the goal of our human development? When we mm. talk all mm. about human development, implicitly we all want peace, mm. but mm. we're actually making the goal more money. Mm, mm. and not peace. And this mm. is where there is a subterfuge, if you will. It's, it's not, we're not, if we don't practice peace, we will not reach peace. Mm. If we practice getting wealthier, we will reach possibly an economy based on wealth creation. Mm, mm. Whether we benefit or not, that is a separate issue, mm. but very, very few people are benefiting. Mm. But, I mean, somebody, so I, I hear you when you say that, uh, you know, uh, the, the, there is a small group of people concentrated wealth and trickle down doesn't happen. Uh, but I think the current discourse is that uh, somebody has to pay for this and there is a small price when we build a highway to go through a, a jungle and there will be a corridor. There has to be somebody who has to foot the bill and uh, therefore as we are all going on a development path and making our countries great again and all. Uh, we can't help but have some side effects and some damaging effects. That's what basically we are trying to say that okay, we minimize those damages, but we plan to link the rivers and do all of that. So I think the, the, the broad thrust of development that we are all in and the fact that it's creating a lot of violence. What, what do you feel about that? How does one deal with that kind of everybody wants development, everybody wants the best they can and they really believe that this current way will redeem them, there will be that destination. So See, what, what is important is not just to follow the herd. I think if one really believes that you want peace, if you really choose peace, as we talked about, and want to communicate peacefully and want to do conflict resolution, if you choose that, if you don't want to choose that, that's a different thing. Mm -hmm. But if you want to choose it, then you need to choose to disengage from the violence of an economic system which is not promoting uh, the most marginalized in that system. Mm, you know, mm. Gandhi gave the talisman to think whenever you're thinking about what steps to take, you think of the poorest man or woman you have ever met in your life, and it is that person's plight or that person's situation on which you must base your decisions. Mm -hmm. That is essential to an inclusive society. Mm -hmm. Inclusion is the way of peace. Mm -hmm. That is the way. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. if we want to exclude communities, caste groups, women, then we're going to have a violent society. Very good. They'll always come back in some way as... They'll come back resisting. in some way. They don't... People don't just sit mum. Right. They, they respond because they need to survive and they respond. So even though we go back to those displaced Narmada uh, people, these what one would call economic refugees within India, mm -hmm. these people will obviously not create secure systems. They will create a situation where the state and companies need to come into some way to keep security because it won't be human security and human security is the most basic security and that is that coincides with peace then in the current times where we are surrounded by the loud noise of this kind of development and all around us are people who want to move in that direction uh, and there's this whole baffling system in front of us which marching on at such a pace, 
what is an authentic individual response what is solidarity look like what can we support what 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 options does an individual have if you they don't follow the herd what would you say are some very actionable practical steps what are some things going on that could we could join into and what well i think that some of the work of uh, some of the organizations which are trying to bring people into groups with marginalized communities you know urban youth together with marginalized people or uh, civil society with or even movements like ekta parishad these are opportunities to build something other in groups because it's very hard as a single individual mm-hmm. i can choose not to uh, fill up my gas tank with multinational oil uh, and i may choose to ride a bicycle but that's not going to take me very far hmm. Hmm. i need to build a group with me you hmm. know and a group consciousness which will act as a pressure point to provide space in which i can live non violently hmm. in the society hmm. and i think that is why uh, a group like ekta parishad is talking about jai jagat hmm. it's saying jai jagat is a movement or a campaign but it's actually a space where people can act non-violently mm, mm, and they can act non-violently together towards a common vision mm. and try to move persistently and patiently to to uh change the system now there is no question that whenever you start any kind of change process there's huge resistance but that's why we have the conflict resolution training mm, how mm. to deal with resistance how to remain calm how to be persistent how to hold on to principles and not to let go because you look like you're the odd person out you know gandhi said they're going to fight you they're going to humiliate you they're going to do everything in the power people who are representing status quo interests they'll do anything in their power they may even kill you you know and i think that this is where you need an internal strengthening not only individually but as a group in order to confront that level of resistance which is violence often mm. state violence or uh private army is can be violent or a uh, very subtle hatred and gangs can be violent and how do you respond one thing is clear you never use violence against violence and you always try to find in your interlocutor a way to persuade them to mm. your side mm. this is the big difference you don't um, you don't try to say our way is morally right you're morally wrong therefore get out of the way mm. Mm. that would only be a reaction of group violence against another group what you have to do and it's a very long and tedious process is you have to slowly convince them that so many people are on this side that they must recognize it and you try to befriend mm. the police uh the bureaucrat the politician the general public the journalist to come on to your side that is the non-violent form of social action which is necessary if you want to build a non-violent mm-hmm. movement and the but the goal is peace you've always got to keep your goal as you want peace you want a development model that builds peace that doesn't just build money and uh, so this is why we are doing the jai jagat campaign right now in ekta parishad and igint is supporting it uh, these spaces for building peace collectively great thank you so much jilbin uh, and want to also acknowledge your cd this beautiful place where we are at uh and also the bihar media labs that trying and putting this together so thank you so much for being here jai jagat we hope we can join into jai jagat in which way we can jai jagat sukare jo jai jagat jai jagat jai jagat sukare